Before moving on to our first scene, I want to take a closer look to another concept that we briefly saw before. The data type. I also want to see in more details the attributes. We considered this in relation to the point and color attributes. But what is a data type? Basically, it represents the kind of data an attribute can contain. Let's see this with a simple example. Create a new file and add a torus object. Now I'm going to add a new attribute to the geometry. You should already know how to do that. Move the mouse on the node panel, press the tab key, and search for the attribute create node. But there is a problem. This node seems to be disappeared. The reason is that we are trying to add this node in the object level. As mentioned before, this is the context is where we create objects, lights and cameras, and other stuff. But if we want to manipulate the property of the object, we have to go inside the main container. So, click twice on the torus node. Now we are in the geometry context. And here, we can edit, transform, or add new attributes to the geometry. Well, now we can add the attribute create node. As we already saw, we can choose the element we want to add the attribute to. So, basically, the detail level, or primitives, points, or vertices. Then we have the data type property. We have many options. The most commonly used are the first ones. Float, integer, vector, and string. They represent what type of data the attribute may have. The float one means any number with decimals. For example, 1.52, 5.3, and so on. So, we'll use a float attribute when we have to set decimal numbers. In case of floats, we can also specify what type of attribute it is. For example, it can be interpreted as position, vector, or color. So, Houdini knows we want to use this attribute for a specific purpose. For example, set this property to color. This means that we want to store a color value in this attribute. But, as you choose this, an alert icon appears on the node. This is a useful way to be notified that something is not going well. This is not an error, but something we have to pay attention to. An error is something more serious. For example, if we disconnect the node from the previous one, we have an error message. And, by the way, to disconnect a node, you can press and hold the Y key and draw a line over the connection you want to delete. Now, reconnect the nodes. We can see the alert or error message by middle mouse clicking on the node. And the alert says that we need three values for a color. Indeed, a color is represented by three values. Red, green, and blue. So, we have to create an attribute that contains three values. And we can do that with the size property. Set this value to three. As soon as you do that, the alert disappears. This because, now we have a color attribute that contains three values, as we expect it to be. So, you can type three different values in the first three fields of the value property. For example, 0 0.9, 0 0.7, and 0 0.1. You may be wondering why I wrote values from 0 to 1. This because each color component of an RGB color is represented by a float number from 0 to 1. As some of you may have noticed, we basically created a vector attribute. We'll see this in a moment. But the question is, why don't we see the color in the object? Yes, we created a color attribute, and we told Houdini to treat it as color. But this simply means that this attribute has to store a color data. This doesn't mean that this has to be the color applied to the geometry. We already saw how to color an object. We did this with the color node. So, let's add a color node and connect it to the torus. Again, here we have three fields. If you type some values here, for example 0 0.1, 0 0.8, and 0, the torus turns green. So, what is the difference from before? If you click with the middle mouse button on this node, we have the CD attribute. And we already saw this in the previous lesson.
This means that the native name for the color attribute is CD. Well, let's go back to the attribute create node. As attribute name, type CD. The torus turns orange. And this because now we are overwriting a native attribute that in this case represents the color. So we learned that we can create a new attribute from scratch. Or we can overwrite an attribute that already exists. Indeed, if you open the info tab of this node, we have the same CD attribute as in the color node. The color node is simply a fastest way to set the color of an object. Let's do another example. In the same info panel, we also have the P attribute, that is the position. And we have also seen this before. As a simple exercise, you should try to manually change the position of the points with the same method we just saw. Well, let's do this together. Select the attribute create node and simply write P in the name field. Be aware to write P in uppercase. The torus disappears. This because all the points have moved to the location we set in the value field. So, basically, they are all in the same position in the space. Now you are able to create a new attribute or modify the value of an existing one. We can move on to the next data types. Change the name of the attribute to something else so we can see our torus again. And, by the way, you can see this attribute in the info panel. Well, the next data type is the integer one. This simply means a number without decimals. For example, 3, 5, or 10,000. The field on the right of data type has disappeared. This because we can't treat an integer number as color or position. They have to be float types. But we still can assign different sizes. So, basically, we can have vectors values also with integers. But, for the moment, let's reset the size to 1. This means that this attribute contains a scalar value. And the related value is the first one in the value field. The following data type is the vector one. This is exactly as the vector we created before. But this time, it is automatically created for us, without the need of specifying the size value. As in the previous case, we have a maximum of four values. This means that we can create a vector up to four numbers. When we take in accounts vectors, they can be represented in different ways, based on the specific property they represent. For example, we already talked about colors and positions. A color vector is an attribute that simply contains three values. One for the red, green, and blue component. In the position vector, each value represents a position along the x, y, and z axis. But, if we consider another kind of vector, for example the velocity one, it represents a direction in the space. In this case, the direction along the x, y, and z axis. The same is true for the normal vector, which represents the orientation of a face in the space. The last data type we want to consider is the string one. This simply means that it can contain a sequence of letters. Now we can move on to create our first scene. The concepts we saw in the previous lessons, such as node manipulation, attributes, and groups, will be very useful in the next classes, where we'll consider more complex stuff, such as simulations, particles, etc. We saw how to add some basic objects to the scene. But this time, I want to show how to import a ready-made object. First of all, we have to download a 3D model. Sketchfab is a beautiful place where to find 3D objects. And in particular, the CC0 collection. Here there are hundreds of 3D models that were modeled with the photogrammetry technique. And you can download them under the CC0 license, which means that they can be used without any restriction. So, this is also a good resource to have some great models for your exercises. For example, let's download this beautiful sculpture.
In this case, it is in the OBJ format. Once downloaded, you generally have two folders. Source with the 3D object and the textures one. Now, create a new file. The better way to organize your work is by creating a project folder. You can do that by selecting New Project from the File menu. You are prompted with a window where you can choose which folders you want to add to your project. We can leave them all for now. In the Path field in the top of the window, choose where you want to store your project. Also, give a name to the project. There is also a note saying that the dollar job will be set to the path you chose. This is something that have to be clarified, otherwise can be the cause of some confusion. In order to save files, store reference to assets, and so on, Houdini uses some environment variables that, precisely, store a reference to these paths. The job variable is for paths related to the entire project, for example textures, that you share between different scene files. This allows you to create relative references to the assets, making the project more portable. When you click Accept, Houdini automatically creates this folder structure. And we have folders to save textures, geometries, video, and so on. So, you can copy the 3D object you downloaded in the Geo folder. And the textures to the text folder. This ensures a well-organized project. Now you have to save your Houdini file. As you can see, on the left of the window, you have the job variable. This automatically points to the project folder you just created. So, if you click on the job variable, you are redirected to the correct folder. You also have the hip variable. This refers to the location where you save your Houdini scene files. Generally, it is a good idea to save them in the same folder as your project. But you could save them in another location. And this is the reason why we have this additional variable. If you save the scene file in the project directory, Houdini automatically sets the hip variable to the same path as the job one. If this is the case, you can indifferently use the hip or job variable to save scene files and assets. But if, for some reasons, they point to different locations, you can refer to the hip variable to save your scene files. And the job one to import assets, save renderings, and so on. Well, now we can import the 3D model. Place the mouse over the node panel and add a file node. For the sake of simplicity, from now on, I won't repeat each time to press the tab key and search the related node. When I'll say to add a particular node, you already know how to do. The file node can be used to import a model in Houdini. And again, this is only the main container. So, double click on the node and select the file node inside. In the geometry file field, you have to select the object you downloaded. As we saw before, choose the job variable and select the 3D model inside the geo folder. In the geometry file field, the file path is relative to the job variable. You can see the path of these variables by clicking the aliases and variables item in the edit menu. The 3D object seems to be too big. So, add a transform node and scale it down. Based on the display options, you could have a sort of chessboard on the model. This represents the UV map of the model. An UV map is basically a way to say Houdini how to wrap a texture around an object. We can disable it by clicking on the related icon. Now we want to add a plane where to place the sculpture. In order to do that, press the control key and then click on the grid icon. The control button ensures that the grid is placed in the center of the world.
Notice that when you added the grid, a new node was created in the object level. Now, move the sculpture above the plane. It can be useful to switch to the front or any lateral view. You can do that by clicking on this button and then choosing the view you prefer. Well, now we have our basic scene. In the next lesson, we'll see how to add lights and camera.